Welcome to our presentation on sleep difficulties in children and young people with neurodevelopmental disorders. We recognise that there are mixed opinions around the correct terminology when discussing autism. Considering this, we have included in this presentation the most common phrases that may be used and heard by the general population today. The aims and objectives of this presentation are to develop an understanding of why children need sleep, to explore the science of sleep, to discuss common sleep problems, to think about factors that may influence sleep, to discuss and reflect on your child's sleep difficulties and to think about strategies that may promote better sleep. Why do children need sleep? Sleep is extremely important for all children and adults. It helps to promote your child's physical health and emotional well-being. It helps promote cell growth and repair. It supports your child's communication, memory, concentration and play skills. And importantly, it's so parents can sleep as well. It's important for parents to get a good night's sleep. Evidence tells us that sleep improves our tolerance levels and promotes positive relationships. How can sleep difficulties affect your child? You're likely to know how sleep affects you and your child, but we've listed some of the most common symptoms. They include being more grumpy, changes in mood and being irritable, being more hyperactive or on the go, or the opposite, sluggish and having low energy levels. A child may struggle to learn and function, struggle to function in everyday tasks, find it harder to concentrate, including listening or concentrating to communicate effectively be less tolerant or compliant and struggle to follow instructions or organise themselves, be at increased risk of accidents and be restricted in their social activities which can impact upon their behaviour and social development. All these things can also apply to parents and siblings too. So now we move on to thinking about the sleep cycle, which is important in achieving a good night's rest. There are two main types of sleep. These are non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep. You're likely to know these by their shortened versions, which are non-REM and REM sleep. So first we experience non-REM sleep, followed by a short period of REM sleep before the cycle starts over. To complete a cycle, we must progress through a series of stages before REM sleep is attained. I'll briefly talk you through these now. Stage one is the initiation of sleep. Our eyes are closed, but we can be easily awakened and may not feel as if we've slept. This stage lasts for around five to 10 minutes. Stage one is where we usually experience that sudden feeling of falling and can jolt awake all of a sudden. Stage two is a period of light sleep where our heart begins to slow and our body temperature decreases. We begin to become less aware of our surroundings as we prepare for deep sleep. By stage three, we've reached deep sleep. At this point, people become less responsive to noises and activity in the environment and may not even respond. If aroused from sleep at this stage, we're likely to feel very disorientated while we attempt to make sense of a situation. Stage three is actually when night terrors or sleepwalking can occur for some people. 
It's during these deep stages of non-REM sleep where our body repairs and regenerates tissues, builds bones and muscles and strengthens the immune system. Once we've progressed through the first three stages, we achieve REM sleep. So, as the name suggests, we experience the eye movements which are fast and in different directions, but our breathing will also become more irregular. This is the stage of sleep when dreams occur, so you're likely to have some interesting stories if woken at this stage. Now we will consider some types of sleep difficulty. We all night wake, which can sometimes be three or four times in one night, and we won't even remember waking as we fall straight back to sleep. The common concern is that when a child night wakes, they often can't get back to sleep. Common sleep difficulties include struggling to get off to sleep, especially alone, waking early, increased night waking, sleeping in the day, sleepwalking, night terrors, periodic limb movement disorder, which happens during sleep and is an involuntary movement, restless leg syndrome, this may happen during sleep or when awake and is a voluntary movement in response to a sensation in the limbs. It presents as an irresistible desire to move the limbs. It is a very common sleep and movement disorder. Rhythmic movement disorder. This can be observed just prior or during sleep. The affected child may rock or move part of the body in a rhythmic manner. This may involve the arm, hand, head or trunk. Although these movements may be relatively gentle and constitute a form of self-soothing to ease into sleep, they can also be more extreme, which is where the sleep difficulties occur. Restlessness or poor sleep quality. Not achieving the full REM cycle. Why do children struggle to sleep? Reasons could include toileting needs, for example needing changing or needing to go to the toilet, diet, certain types of food or drink such as sugary or sweet items or those containing caffeine can make us feel more alert before bed. Eating too late or going to bed hungry can also impact upon our sleep. Unwell or in pain, this could include asthma, eczema, chronic acute conditions, physical difficulties or discomfort. Overstimulated. If children are overstimulated before going to bed, it's likely they will struggle to sleep. Some children have increased sensitivity to blue light from smartphones, laptops and other screens or sensitivity to certain sounds which may be upsetting or distracting to them. Playing on computer games, watching TV till late or reading overstimulating books can all have an impact on a child's ability to sleep. Also consider their bedrooms and whether it's an environment that promotes sleep and encourages them to relax. Lack of activity most children need a good balance of activities throughout the day to tire them out and also provide proprioceptive input. Proprioception is one of our senses that allows us to know where our body is in space. Many proprioceptive activities such as lifting, pushing and pulling can have a calming effect on the body. Environment the environment can play a significant role in your child's sleep difficulties. Think about the temperature of the room, the feel of the fabric on their bedding, light that might be coming through the window from the street lamps, noise in the home environment or outside, stimulation in the bedroom including having too many toys on show, prints on the curtains and on bed sheets, posters on the walls, 
brightly painted walls. Think about your child's comfort. Is their sleepwear comfortable for them? Also, sharing with siblings or other family members may prove difficult. Emotions including feelings of anxiety or worry. This is especially important to think about in children with autism and also in teenagers. Consider typical childhood fears, for example the dark, monsters, ghosts, insects, but also any worries they may have when trying to sleep, as well as the emotional impact of sleep becoming an issue or a battleground. Sensory seeking children need strategies for calming. Without addressing these, it may lead to behaviour that challenges. If you feel your child may struggle with sensory seeking behaviours, please speak to an occupational therapist. Lack of routine. Routine is really important for giving the brain cues that it is time to get ready to sleep. Children who have difficulties with understanding the concept of time, particularly if it's light outside, are going to struggle to sleep. Also consider the impact of daytime naps and whether this could be hindering your child's ability to sleep later in the day. Medication may have an impact on sleep and also feeding issues, for example the use of feeding tubes. Researchers estimate that between 40% and 80% of autistic children have difficulty sleeping and may have difficulty being able to express why they are struggling to sleep. Ways to promote sleep include helping your child to feel safe and secure, teaching your child to fall asleep on their own when ready, try and make the environment as calm as possible at bedtime, adopt a consistent bedtime routine and avoid caffeine or other stimulants such as iPads, smartphones and laptops before bedtime. If you are worried about your child's sleep, keeping a sleep diary will help you get an accurate picture of your child's sleep patterns. They can be helpful for identifying reasons why your child is not sleeping or has difficulties sleeping. Our tips for keeping a sleep diary are, try to record any activity straight away. You might forget timings by the morning. If your child sleeps elsewhere, ask them to complete the diary too. Fill in the diary honestly. If your child wakes up repetitively during the night, record every waking period. Keep the sleep diary during a typical fortnight. Children's routines and patterns will naturally be impacted by events such as Christmas or holidays. If your child is able to understand their own sleep diary, involve them in the process too. Once you have completed the sleep diary, you can begin to examine whether any patterns are emerging with your child's sleep. For example, is the initial act of going to sleep a problem? Is your child taking longer than 30 minutes to get to sleep? Do they wake during the night? Is there a pattern for this waking or any identifiable reason for this? Is your child waking at the same time each morning? On average, how much sleep is your child getting per night? Is your child having few or too many daytime naps? On this slide, you will see an example of a bedtime routine. A sleep routine is something you consistently do every evening. It enables your child to know what is expected of them and what is going to happen next. Children do need routine and it can promote a calmer home. Routine options to consider include the following. Prepare your child a snack. 
preferably not sweet or with lots of sugar in. Encourage a bath. Ensure it's relaxing and not overstimulating. After a bath, your body temperature lowers quickly for the optimum level of sleep. Put pyjamas or sleepwear on. Brush teeth. If this activity causes stress, complete it earlier in your routine. Refer to our self-care advice if this is a particular difficulty. Read a story. Avoid action stories as this will stimulate the child too much. Say good night. It's important that this is clear. Say no more than this and you leave the room. Often it's helpful to support the routine by using a visual schedule or chart. Autistic people can have sensory processing difficulties which make it harder for them to relax and go to sleep as well as stay asleep. Their environment and surroundings can also play a role. It may help to block out light using dark curtains or blackout blinds. Reduce noise using thick carpet, shutting doors fully if the child is able to tolerate this, turning off appliances and moving your child's bed away from a wall with activity going on on the other side. Block out noises by letting the person use earplugs or listen to music through headphones. Remove labels from bedding and night clothes or try bedding and night clothes made from other materials. Reduce smells coming into the room by closing the door fully or by using scented oils that the person finds relaxing. Remove distractions such as toys on the bed and pictures on the wall unless the person finds these relaxing and consider a different colour on the walls. In the following slides, we will be using case studies to highlight the common difficulties and strategies that can be used to promote positive sleep. Our first scenario is mom needs to sit and be with Dominique until she falls asleep every night. She cries when her mom leaves the room or is out of sight. So what would we advise in this scenario? Consider gradual withdrawal. The general principle is to begin by sitting with your child until they fall asleep and then gradually increasing the physical distance between you. They need to be comfortable and be able to tolerate each distance well before increasing further. On the slide you will see one example of how you could divide this approach into stages but you need to make this work for your own environment at home. Another strategy is the gradual extinction checking method. This is where you say goodnight and leave the room. If your child is crying or showing signs of distress after a set time, for example up to 10 minutes, go into them and tell them it's bedtime, time to sleep and leave the room. The length of time you wait is what you feel comfortable with. The first few nights you will probably experience several hours of crying. Keep interaction minimal and neutral. Leave your child the same amount of time and if still crying go in again and repeat until they are asleep. At set intervals, either each day, few days or week, Gradually increase the time that you wait before going in. It may be best to try this method on a weekend or during a holiday time. It is probably even harder if you have other children, but it is still best to break the habit sooner rather than later. The whole family needs to know and agree that you will be using this approach so that they can tolerate and support any increase in disruption. If during this scenario your child starts to get out of their bed, try the following technique. 
Each time your child gets out of bed, return them to bed quickly and calmly. Keep interaction minimal. For example, it's time for bed. Repeat the same phrase once only in a neutral voice. Be boring. This will avoid providing reinforcement through reactions. Keep calm. Follow these steps each time your child gets out of bed until they settle. You may have to repeat this many times whilst your child gets used to the change in routine. It may get worse before it gets better. Remember to remain consistent and persistent to ensure this technique is successful. In scenario 2, Dad reports that Reese goes to bed at 7pm every night but constantly wakes during the night, night waking, and can't fall back to sleep by himself. Firstly, it's important to identify why Reese might be waking up during the night. Too much sleep during the day, going to bed too early and sleeping in all impact on nighttime sleeping. Speak to school if you have concerns that they are sleeping a lot there, but only if this is having an impact on their sleep at night. Reduce contact. If the child gets up to seek an adult or to play, put them straight back to bed with minimal interaction. Avoid interactions during the night. For example, toilet stops, drinks or snacks, taking them downstairs, as they will quickly learn to expect this. Give them a reason to stay in their own bed. Link it with their interests, but avoid things that are too stimulating. An option for tackling the example in Scenario 2 is to trial scheduled awakenings. These are used to reset a child's internal body clock and support them to sleep through the night. Firstly, use a diary to know what time nighttime wakings are usually occurring. If they wake at virtually the same time every night, then try to wake the child up 15 to 30 minutes before and let them go back to sleep. Don't wake them fully, just allow them to open their eyes and do this every night until they are sleeping right through after you have woken them. Then try a night of not waking them to see if their sleep pattern has been extended. This process could take weeks, but it will be worth it in the end. It's all about persevering. In our third scenario, Mum reports that Victoria wakes up at 5am every morning, sometimes earlier, and wishes she would sleep for longer. In this scenario, consider the different sleep needs of children of different ages. An average three-year-old will need 12 hours sleep, six-year-olds need 10 hours sleep, and a teenager will need eight to nine hours sleep. Also consider the number of naps that they may be having through the day. Try using a sleep trainer alarm clock. Set the clock, and if the child doesn't get up till it goes off, Give them lots of praise. You can then try and gradually change the time of the alarm to encourage the child to sleep or stay in bed longer. There are many varieties of these, so pick one that will suit your child and be meaningful to them. Keep a sleep diary and record how much sleep your child gets. Are they getting enough? Blackout blinds. Daylight can wake children early and they can think it's time to get up. In the summer months particularly, it can start getting light around 5 a.m. Try and block out as much light as possible. Some children may need a light on at night. However, this is different to natural light. Use praise and rewards for staying in bed or remaining asleep. Consider a morning playtime in their room. This is only really for children who are getting enough sleep, but still tend to wake up early. Try using your child's interests. For slightly older children, six years and onwards, they may occupy themselves in their room 
until a set time to avoid disturbing other people in the household. In scenario 4, Dad reports Tommy finds it really hard to relax in the evenings and he is very active. Going to sleep is then a real challenge as he can't settle and fidgets constantly. Things to consider for this scenario include stimulation. Think about what could be stimulating your child before bed. This could be consuming caffeinated drinks or snacks, screen time or having too much visual stimulation in their bedroom. Think about your child's general levels of activity. If your child is too active before going to sleep, this can impede sleep. Consider whether their activity levels reflect their normal levels of activity or if there's an increase. Consider the possibility that there may be an underlying medical reason. Discuss your concerns with a health professional such as your health visitor, school nurse or GP. Sensory needs may be causing issues. Is there any evidence of sensory processing problems? For example, seeking extra input about where their body is, such as squashing themselves into small tight spaces or cuddling very firmly. Are they seeking vestibular input, such as rocking or spinning? It's also important to consider the child's physical health or any pain they may be experiencing, and also to consider their levels of anxiety. So what can we do to address the issues in scenario four? If you feel your child may have difficulties with sensory processing, attend a parent education session with regards to this, or refer to our home programmes relating to sensory processing and calming strategies. Weighted blankets are usually prescribed by an OT. In principle, they are draped on the child's bed a parent will then supervise the child and remove once the child's asleep. They're not suitable for certain medical conditions, including epilepsy, and should be no more than 10% of the child's body weight. If this is something you're thinking about doing, please speak to the team before purchasing one, as there is specific guidance to follow. The idea of a tent is that it's a safe, private and calming area a child can go to. Try using sheets to construct a space and use soft materials, cushions and blankets to make it cosy. Limit bedroom decorations by avoiding using too many posters, lights or distractions. Try storing toys away or covering them with a sheet. Also consider wall paint and aim for neutral colours. You may want to engage the child in activities that are relaxing and not too stimulating, such as reading or telling a story, puzzles, cuddling soft toys, quietly singing a song, massage and deep pressure, or gently move in slow, linear, repetitive movements, such as rocking. In our final scenario, Jordan is a teenage boy who struggles to get to sleep at night. He often goes to bed late and struggles to wake up for school in the morning. During the day he feels very tired and this is impacting upon his performance in school. Research suggests that during adolescence the circadian rhythm or internal body clock is reset. This means teenagers feel sleepier later on and wake up later the next morning. Think about their routine. Using a sleep diary or helping them create one will help you identify patterns in their routine 
that could be impacting sleep. Monitor what they are watching on TV or what they are reading. Is it too stimulating? Think about your child's exercise levels during the day. Are they getting enough or are they engaging in it too close to bedtime? Consider whether your child has any concerns or worries that may be hindering their sleep at night. For example, school, friendships, relationships, appearance. Also consider whether your child has any sensory processing difficulties. If you believe they do, refer to the earlier slide around environmental considerations and if problems persist, contact a professional. A bedtime routine is important at any age. Going to bed at the same time every night will help strengthen their internal body clock. Adolescents often find it difficult to relax. Help them explore activities that they find relaxing. For example, reading, drawing, colouring and listening to certain music. Be mindful that some TV and books can be stimulating so it's important to find the right content. Also aim to reduce screen time for up to one hour before bed. Exercise is proven to improve sleep. Therefore, explore exercises your young person can do at home or in the community. Check what your young person is eating and drinking before going to bed. Caffeine should be avoided up to four hours before bed Remember, it can be found in chocolate as well as tea and coffee. Going to bed hungry or with a full stomach can also impede sleep. Make sure they are exposed to light during the day. Opening the curtains in the morning or switching on the light will help the body's natural body clock. Use a visual timetable so your child knows what to expect for the next day. Talk about any worries they may have. Encouraging your child to write down their worries or make a to-do list before they go to bed can improve sleep and mean they're less likely to lie awake worrying. Think about the environmental considerations we discussed earlier in the presentation. A blackout blind will block out light during the evenings and early mornings of summer. Also consider how much visual stimuli is in their bedroom. Dim light in the evening will help the release of melatonin, a hormone that is released by the brain and helps regulate sleep. Remember that although they are a young person, they will still need parental guidance and boundaries. On this slide, we have identified the key points to remember. Try to identify what is affecting your child's sleep. Consider keeping a diary. Adopt a good sleep routine. Choose one strategy and use every night for at least two weeks. Be consistent. Use praise and rewards. Only start when you are ready as a family. Support each other. It can be tough. Be patient. It will take time. And ask for support if things are still difficult. On this slide, we have some suggestions of websites you may find useful. These include Cerebra, Sleep Scotland, Contact a Family, Scope UK, National Autistic Society and the NHS website. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We hope you have found it useful and that we have covered many of the concerns that you have. If you feel we could have covered additional content, please feed this back to us. 
we aim to review the presentations annually and will constantly consider improvements. Thank you for listening.